This video will be about the curious details which we noticed on the ruins in Turkey and Bulgaria during the spring expeditions of uh, 2018 and sadly all that I can show you will be indeed curious details I won't be able to convey the main thing which is the touch of this uh, magical spirit of the ancient people who lived here and particle, small particle of their spirit is still present in the surroundings in which they lived. These were people with purer and stronger spirits than us because they were attuned with the nature. They lived with the stone, literally. And when I was organizing the expedition, the reason was that I heard that in the type of ruins I call elf castles, there are actually huge megalithic elements. Also, I was uh, suspicious that uh, some intentional growing of stone might have been involved. But upon arrival, it became clear that there is no megalithic element at all. It's all rock cut and the reason for which some people have convinced themselves there is something like this is because they came and they felt the magnetism of this uh, spirit of the pure ancient people because purity is beauty it attracts and some modern men with their digitalized psyche they decided, oh, this is majestic, this is exceptional, this is mind-blowing. So some sort of advanced technology must have been involved. Because we get very easily confused. We put an equation mark between advanced beings and advanced electrical technical gadgets. If we don't portray them in our own mind, carrying high-tech lasers, which we don't have, they will not look great enough for us to create these impressive ruins. We get glimpses of the harmony and beauty of their world, and we translate it to our small mind, square mind terms, and then it sounds like this. Oh, they must have had power tools then. And another thing, very important, which I won't be able to convey, is the sheer amount, volume of ruins. In the beginning, when we would see ruins in the distance, we would stop and walk to get to them. But then in no time we realize that there is no need to walk half a kilometer in the fields because all one needs to do is just open the door of the car and it's just ruins everywhere you go. Or if one is tired or likes easy life, you can see them even without opening the door of the car. It's just everywhere, like in Italy. And their villages and towns thrive in the ruins. They are the ruins. Actually, from what I gather, what I have seen so far, Turkey seems to be the country in the world which is richest in ruins in terms of volumes, in terms of numbers. We are talking about countless kilometers of uh, multi-storied stone dwellings, certainly capable of housing millions, which of course, as usual, doesn't match at all the official historic data about the historic population numbers of the region. And although most of the rock dwellings in Turkey certainly cannot rival the artistic stone carvings, let's say in 
Khmer in Cambodia or in Egypt, you may get even a better feel of the spirit of the ancient people in Turkey because most of the ruins here are not yet ruined by renovation, ruined by the archaeologists who kill their spirit by turning them into commercial hubs for plastic souvenirs where most of the ruins end up to be modern construction. Although now they may look rather rough, at their prime, these buildings might have been much more beautiful. This is a rare, but not the only example of a still standing plastering. And since this looks more like some sort of hole for storage, maybe if the habitable room had also plastering, maybe they also had beautiful frescoes. We saw the same thing in Italy, uh, plastering with uh, very pale remains of frescoes. We saw that on the facades of uh, this type of uh, dwellings in Italy, although this is footage from Turkey, Actually, they are uh, interchangeable because not only the style is the same, but the very uh, entries, the ornaments, the decoration lines, they are absolutely identical. And I still believe even more now that these were the same people, the same civilization. And in the survivors episode on Africa, you can see the very same ruins even in Ethiopia. And the overall situation with the rock cut ruins is the same all the way from Ethiopia to Spain to Turkey to Japan. They are all known only on local level. They are not uh, shown to the public together. All they are telling us is, you see, this must be the tome of this and that great King, this rectangular cutting and immediately in the minds of those who listen that is like uh, sounds like a confirmation of all the stories they are telling us about that king and when he lived exactly and here the modern counterpart of all those uh, tomes and necropolises that they always focus our attention on Besides the road, I saw the tomb of the greatest current European king must be. See how long it is. The cows come to drink water out there. Or I don't know, the street dogs or something. And besides the tomb of the greatest European king, we see some sort of shed cast out of cement with abundant remains of art on the walls and if you see its shape it strikingly resembles all those ancient necropolises or maybe so-called necropolises 
And back to the topic of uh, casting, this entire uh, piece with the lions and the ornaments, it kind of uh, had the feel as if it is uh, made of somewhat different material than the rest of the bedrock around it. And all these little faces looking down, that's like at Baalbek, you know, every the top of all the cornices, there's always little faces looking down. And a couple of other spots also left the impression that plaster has been used. And uh, in their prime time, these buildings might have been very, very beautiful. <laughs> The world-famous Hittite rock carvings are actually also plastered on. That's how this polished, smooth appearance has been achieved. Pericon, Bulgaria. Below the medieval ruins, which are made of stone blocks, lie quite massive rock-cut ruins of the style I call elf castles. And here, uh, as well as at all other elf castles, including Isperuja in Spain and those in Turkey, we see intricate uh, remains of uh, sophisticated door mechanisms. And fortunately, we found the clue what kind of doors do those might have been. We found the clue at this site in Turkey. Up there, you see the way that the, the side of the door goes up into like a little, what would be the, the socket. And then here's the, the, the door carved in down this side and on both sides. So is this, it's just a, a pair of doors open. That's the key. I've never seen that before. So these doors survived in such a good condition because they're not the real doors. They're actually carved in the stone. But the real ones would have been not less sophisticated and nice than this. Uh, the proof is in the central Bulgaria, in the area of the tomb of Starusel, where they found in pieces similar stone door, which also had very intricate locking mechanism. 
It was made in such a way that it would lock only from the inside. While I was taking pictures at Perpericon, I felt something moving below my feet. I was standing on a wall, one of those walls. They built it some two months ago, by the way, in their attempts to cover the old ruins with modern monkey work. The thing fell apart within a few weeks of being made. A very nice illustration of how wise our forefathers were to live in rock-cut ruins. It's something that your children can inherit and live in it for many, many generations without the need to build all the time houses like crazy just because they collapse in just a couple of decades. Because the rock cut ruins were full of what is officially called columbaris, these small niches in the walls, which, as I have shown in previous videos, have nothing to do with pigeons as such. And here we have them right at the right place in the kitchen, Mutfak. Actually, they're rather large, maybe they had entire families of turkeys living in them, they would suffocate from the cooking fire and then drop dead straight in the cooking pot. I wonder how they were managing the situation with the droppings in the kitchen <clears throat> in this uh, scenario. According to a past life regression source, actually the alleged columbaris were used uh, for placing crystals in them. I don't know if that's true, but it would certainly make much more sense. Like, for example, here, these are uh, living quarters. Are you gonna house pigeons above your head, above your bed? I don't even need to make fun of the penguins and their ridiculous theories, because they have made enough fun of themselves. There is no reliable method for dating items or buildings made out of stone, but as far as looks are concerned, the oldest ruins we saw during these expeditions and the oldest looking I've seen ever so far were those on the shores of the Black Sea in Bulgaria. This is how the rectangular openings in the rock look like from ground level.
Some of them appear to be already below sea level and I think that signifies that it is not uh, very wise to believe the mainstream stories they attribute them to relatively recent cultures which thrived when sea levels were not that much drastically different from now. visited a number of what is officially called karst caves and they indeed look like karst caves except certain elements of them which sometimes made us doubt these elements were not that many but still sometimes slight suspicions were crawling in the minds of the observers or what about things being mixed, like uh, natural and not? For example, this is in Bulgaria and this is in Turkey, obviously amongst the rock cut ruins, the height of a 7 or 10 storied building. possibly be the next type of rock cut ruins in terms of age are those which I call Derankuyu style. There are a few special things about Derankuyu. First of all, it's got a name. It's not different from all the other rock cut ruins, but most of the others simply don't have a name. They lay out there in the fields. Well, this one got picked up for the touristic showcase and it has a name. It's not even bigger. And actually, uh, what they allow you to see from it is minute from what we hear about it. <clears throat> Some 20, 30 stories deep. What, what they show you, it's very little, maybe two or three levels. One can go through it in uh, 10 or 15 minutes. The most special feature that you can see there are these enormous doors. What else is uh, different uh, in the Rakuyu is that uh, its original appearance has been badly spoiled. They made all these uh, staircases so you don't get the real impression of how people were um, moving along the premises in the past. You don't get this genuine feeling. A lot of the Holes in the walls have been closed and that's how the original feeling of the place got lost. And by the way, I was wondering how would it feel to breathe that stale air underground. It turned out that the air inside is fresher and better than outside. Because you don't uh, get the street pollution from outside and also due to the well-engineered ventilation shafts. And possibly the refreshing feeling inside is not only due to the good air quality, but also maybe due to the lack of uh, electromagnetic pollution, which is one of the most major factors which sickens modern man. Although very few people relatively are aware about it, what to speak of doing anything practical against it. And here our tour of the underground city has come to an end. In general, there isn't much difference between the 
there are going so-called underground cities and this type of ruins because these were maybe also underground at some point of time. These steps, they are modern. They are not the original entrance and also I could not find any facades as such. Always the ruins and with shaggy ages uh, broken off uh, pieces of uh, boulder broken from earthquakes or erosion. Although most of the rock ruins appear rather plain and simple, there are sometimes symbols on the wall. It seems that the sun symbol is the earliest. And also here along with the sun symbol we start to see the horseman. Here in this room we have two depictions. On left and on the right we have uh, always uh, sun symbol and the horseman. We don't know who he was, all we know is that uh, later on the Christians somehow blended it with uh, their paradigm and uh, the result of this mixture was the emblematic image of Saint George slaying the dragon. We find this mysterious horseman depicted again and again next to or inside the rock cut ruins. This is a huge one from Bulgaria. This is how it looks like now and this is how it looked like at the dawn of the era of the photography. Which proves once again that uh, Things erode much faster than uh, we are led to believe. This is a modern copy made by an artist. This is a similar one from Afghanistan. And this one probably somewhere again from the area of the Balkans. There are plenty of uh, rocket caves in the area of the Madara horsemen. They, you, you can't reach them, you can see them only from far away. Even officially they are recognized as uh, man-made rocket dwellings, although they give no explanation how the allegedly primitive men could have climbed at such heights to make them. But most likely the situation is like in Turkey, there was no need to climb even. Probably these are just the rooms at the periphery which are left, the rest is just uh, destroyed by time and erosion. And then the next generation of uh, relatively younger looking rock ruins would be the elf castles. They very much resemble the Derenkuyu style, but they've got a bit more sophistication in them, like for example the detail with the doors. They are much more elegant and nearer to our idea of what a door should look like compared to the enormous circle doors of Derenkuyu. And this is Hattusha, the famous Hattusha, but uh, on official footage and in the official pamphlets you are not shown exactly these parts of Hattusha. You are always shown 
the more recent work which is made of stone blocks and the rock cut part is as usual ignored. We are still in Hatusha. Here we see the probably megalithic blocks on the top of the rocket older bases. Now this is in the vicinity of the Madara horseman, which we saw earlier in Bulgaria. Again, elfish style elements. The typical minimalistic stairs on the side leading to partially preserved platforms and remains of rooms on the top. What I classify as elf rock cut ruins does seem to bear some relation to the current ground level, while the standard widespread rock cut ruins like these ones, they are absolutely unrelated. Probably they were all underground once upon a time, because whatever you see sticking above ground now, it just continues below ground. We just cannot see it because they don't excavate. There is so much of it. And the next uh, layer of even more recent rock ruins are these. In Turkey they call them Lycian. If you go to Rome they will call them Etruscan. But the truth is that they are so much identical even though they are countries apart. Even the smallest details like the imitation wooden beams on the ceiling even they are identical all across this belt of such ruins around the Mediterranean that uh, it is impossible that they belong to more or less unrelated cultures. And then the last group of people who did really rock cutting were the early Christians. In most cases they simply added their symbols and decoration to the pre-existing rock ruins. They often also enlarged the older rooms, sometimes merging many of them, uh, turning them into holes, making the ceiling much higher. And in general I think they did an excellent job from an artistic point of view in terms of managing to inspire with the very architecture only, with the language of the stone, the language of the form, to inspire the minds of the crowd to seek something higher in life than simply attending to everyday chores. As if these high ceilings with uh, these oval forms were whispering you can connect to higher dimensions, you can expand your consciousness, you can grow far beyond the limits of your body. Here is an example of a converted old rock um, room into church. See how low is the older part. It's clearly distinguished by the different color and how high is the church. I heard from the local people that actually the way they used to uh, cut these churches in the rock is they would start from the very top part 
they wouldn't need any scaffolding for climbing they would start at the top and as they make their way down they would add all the elements they want sometimes the pre-existing rooms would fit well in the new design sometimes not as shown here sometimes the early christian needed to even patch holes in the walls which would open the early christians must have been very practical folks because besides the faces of the saints in their churches there were plenty of depictions of uh, plants and even mushrooms in particular i wouldn't be surprised if they were actively using visionary mushrooms to connect to god to and to travel to the angelic realms As people were getting more and more divorced from this union with Mother Nature, they started building more and more unusual, in a sense, things, like made of small stone blocks. The new buildings were shanty compared to the durable old stuff, so the new people, that would be us, would be kept busy all the time rebuilding new housing for each new generation and also cleaning up the garbage from the fallen buildings which nowadays has reached unimaginable proportions because the materials are not biodegradable although they are fast to fall apart when they are still supposed to serve as house support and on the top of everything set so far, the people would need to invest much more endeavor in maintaining their living space pleasant in terms of heating or cooling. The older cave dwellings simply did not have that problem because the temperature stays more or less constant in cave environments. This is a freshly made path for the tourists who visit the rock cut ruins. It fell apart even before they finished the construction at the other end. But we did not reach this deplorable state of housing affairs straight away. It was, as usual, a gradual degradation. In the beginning, people started mixing the rock cut stuff with the rather large and somewhat irregular megalithic blocks, like in Hattusha, which we visited, along with a couple of smaller sites in the area of the same style. Here they might have had one of those uh, stone doors.
the beginning the polygonal masonry was of very fine quality, but as Kali Yuga started poisoning people's minds, they started to forget the good old craftsmanship and then the stones would fit only in the front, in the back it would be just empty. This is the famous stone found by the Russians and reported to have tool marks from advanced machinery like uh, discs for cutting stone under, under microscope the traces are visible and indeed it does look and feel exactly like that but it is an exception It might have been brought from somewhere else or it could be kind of uh, sticking out from the lower layers when people knew more about building than when they made the most of what is now visible in Hattusha which in overall doesn't leave a high-tech impression of holes in the stone in Hattusha, just hundreds of them. In the local museum they're visually showing how Michael Jackson was making the holes. As we come near to the current moment, the building blocks get smaller and smaller. For example, this cute little church in the beginning left the impression of a high quality, even polygonal stone masonry, but when I looked in detail, they have used the same trick as Hattusha. The stones fit perfectly, but only in the front. At the back, just a gap. And the nearer we come to the current time, the less concerned seem to become people in what kind of a building they reside or visit. I'm having the feeling that these men laying down here don't feel very good in this position, especially that their heads are missing, is the citadel in the heart of Ankara. And this is one of the numerous caravansarays in Turkey, places where the camel caravans would feel safe to spend the night at, especially with their expensive merchandise. And some of the last types of uh, buildings in this region which kept a particle of the old spirit of the times when the beauty 
of the building in which you are meant a lot to the people. So we saw different styles, different layers of rock cut ruins and the older ones definitely lacked the sophistication of the more recent ones. So what does this mean? Is it true after all what the penguins are telling us that we were simple and dumb and gradually we became more sophisticated, we became smarter? No, it doesn't mean that and here are some of the reasons why is that so. First of all, what is left from the older layers is only bare stripped walls, reused probably by many civilizations and many cultures, which not only remodeled them, but probably recycled and reused for whatever they wished, everything more valuable they could find on the walls or inside the rock dwellings. For example, these are modern residential premises. They have those same simple walls with uh, chisel marks. But this doesn't mean that inside these rooms don't walk people who carry around smartphones, which we consider to be something advanced and progressive. It's another point that the people who carry the smartphones themselves, 99% of them or even much more, don't understand the technology of the smartphones as, as such, but that's a separate point. They have them, they use them. So what I'm getting at, the fact that the walls are very rough doesn't mean that everything in those times and belonging to those people was uh, rough and they were not as intelligent as we are. Now, let's look at the full story from a completely different perspective. Let's assume that they indeed completely lacked the sophistication of modern men. I mean, the simple rock cutters who cut the initial simple low ceiling rock cut ruins. Well, again, less sophisticated doesn't mean less advanced. Indeed, many times simple is much more advanced. And let's take an example of uh, the medical science and the branch of the dentistry in particular. Nearly all modern dental treatments require very sophisticated and precise and expensive technology. For example, the regrowing of teeth, those who have uh, had their teeth taken out, they are so-called cutting-edge discoveries that they are telling us will allow one day, in the very near future, but it's not yet for common people, they will plant something and your teeth will grow again, brand new. Super, let's see how many decades by the time it actually reaches the common people. Will it be affordable for them? Will it really work? Will it be safe? Because we know that uh, once the penguins start tempering with the genetic code, it usually tends to end in a disaster. 
But even if we assume that it will be all good, still, what is the point of all this expensive stuff and surgeries and equipment and things when people can regrow their teeth, fresh new teeth, simply with the power of their thoughts and intention. And this has been proven actually in hundreds and possibly thousands of cases. A couple of uh, researchers have uh, made publications, it's not even something new, people have tried already, and many, many of them have succeeded growing teeth, brand new teeth. Even this lady made it and she is over 100. As a bonus, in her case, even fresh new young hair started growing on her skull. So I don't know how famous are the methods of regrowing teeth naturally in the Western world, but at least in Russia the publications are plentiful. There are many success stories already. It's not just one or two people or a rumor. Decide for yourself who is more advanced, the people who grow their teeth the natural way or those who risk their health and sacrifice a lot of their money to have it done using a sophisticated surgical procedure. And now another example, this time from the realm of art. I consider myself lucky, I've been around the world a lot and I saw so much art. I looked at it very carefully, I enjoy art actually for a couple of years, I even used to paint myself. I have seen masterpieces which I really consider stunning, they have enriched my being just by seeing them and some of them had such an amazing detail, really astonishing and yet even the finest pieces of what I saw would be very low grade compared to the art shown to me by people who lived in this type of dwellings, people whose intellectual capacity appears to have been less than that of the people who engineered the simple rock-cut dwellings that is based at least on their worldly achievements, so to say, because at least the rock-cut dwellings are multi-storied, they have shafts and other um, engineering elements, things like that. The people who showed me the far superior amazing art in the huts, what they did is they gave me to drink a herbal tea called ayahuasca. And with that I had visions of an art which I never imagined even that it can exist. Why? It was as graceful as uh, this art that you see now and even more. But the detail was much more. Here you, ca you, you can zoom, you can use lens, even microscope sometimes. But still there is a limit to which you can zoom. And then it will get pixelated or blurry or not artistic anymore. It will get coarse. Well, in the ayahuasca art I saw, there was no limit to the zooming. You could uh, zoom into one of these leaves that the lady is holding and you will find an entire world with the beings inside this leaf. Another disadvantage of this art is that it is frozen, while the ayahuasca art is very very dynamic, everything is alive and moves constantly, and it is not flattened, even though this is 3D, it is still on the wall, you are not in the art, while in the visions you can uh, really be inside the art, like everything around you is art, and when comparing both types of art, this rich Baroque or Renaissance 
samples and the visionary ayahuasca art. The second is so much more superior because it interacts with the viewer, it's got a consciousness. This is a whole new level, I mean even simple, unconscious interactive art is an idea which is still in infancy for the modern men who consider themselves the crown jewel of all intelligence. While the men in the hut, I mean, they are like 1000 levels ahead of us. So this is just another example of how people who to most modern men will appear dumb and not at all sophisticated actually can create with uh, their thoughts combined with ancient knowledge about special tea making art which is miles ahead of any modern medium it is so advanced and i'm giving all this example about simple things and sophisticated things not to confuse you and blur your discrimination even further. It is not that advanced and backwards civilizations don't exist. Just because everything is relative. Another famous phrase, which is very often used to confuse people on purpose. There are simple civilizations and advanced ones. The point I want to make is that the understanding of most modern men of what actually advanced is has been distorted by the TV and the media to make us a really dumb and backwards crowd.